Right, good afternoon everyone. Uh, my name is Julian Richards, I'm the chair of this afternoon session, uh, which although it was co-organised with uh, Gareth Neal and Nicole Smith and was actually really their brainchild, uh, unfortunately uh, they can't be here because fortunately for them they had a baby a few weeks ago and so I'm sure I'll send everyone's congratulations uh, to them. But that does mean that I'm here as the sort of fall guy and standing uh, chair. Um, but the, the idea for the session arose really from a few of us that had um, been involved in one way or another with a call in the UK that the HRC put out for what they called immersive experiences, which was looking at the, at the way in which virtual reality and other uh, interactive media could be used in uh, heritage. And so we got a core of papers who received HRC funding that were very pleased with also had other contributions to the session uh, from other speakers. Um, so um, that does mean though that because of the, the absence of uh, Gareth and Nicole, we will have a, a, a gap in the program at approximately 1620, which we may use to take some discussion if there are discussion yeah. points at that, that point in the program. Um, I, can everyone hear me without using the microphone? Can you hear me, Sarah? You're probably sitting further to that. Good, right. So I'll, uh, I'll just carry on speaking up. Um, I know there's also been a little bit of confusion because several speakers have asked me as to how long the presentations are for. Are for. The organisers have said uh, that the presentation should be 50 minutes. We're allowing five minutes for questions. And therefore, I will be holding up that after, you, after you've spoken for uh, 10 minutes. Uh, however, I know that some people had prepared for 20, so I won't hold up that <laughs> <laughs> until the 20 minute uh, uh, spot. Well, that will mean that you've used up your discussion, but I will try and stop you eating into it someone else's time if you overrun, which I think is fair. So I hope that's, that's fair enough and is a, a reasonable compromise. Um, I'm also asked to ask all speakers to sign uh, this uh, form if you come up at the end of the session actually rather than uh, do it now just to, I think it's the sort of release form to say whether you're happy for your presentation to go on YouTube or whatever. Okay, so uh, without any more introduction, I'd like to call on our first speaker, which is uh, Pat Cooper from the University of, of York with a paper joint with Dave Murphy, which is going to tell you more about. Hello. Can you hear me? I don't have a very strong voice, so I know that I don't project very well. Uh, good afternoon. I'm going to start with an apology, or well, two apologies in fact. Um, I'm going to do that really rude thing where I'm going to present and then I'm going to leave. Um, <laughs> the session moved, I know, I'm really sorry. The session was moved and um, I've got to be in Norfolk for a wedding tomorrow morning. So I'm afraid uh, my personal life has had to take a, a, like a, a slight more importance for once. Um, okay, so... Um, <laughs> I apologise to all the people who may have heard me talk about this project before, but I am trying to give it a slightly different spin and I'm turning around and talk to, talking about it in a slightly different way. So I hope you can appreciate that uh, and maybe uh, enjoy it a little bit. So this uh, project was my last postdoc. I've since moved on to do other, more, well, different things basically. Um, but it was a project that kind of emerged from a series of different research groups at the University of York. So when I was working on this project, I sat between the Department of History the Audio Lab, which is part of the Department of Engi uh, Electronic Engineering, and also the Digital Creativity Labs. While well, I'm actually an archaeologist, which was a really, really interesting experience. Oh, thank you very much. So, let me set the scene. Um, a few years ago, I would have to start this talk by saying, um, does anyone know what this building is? But I think based on the current political situation in the UK, <laughs> everyone knows that this is the house of Commons in the UK, and uh, well, let's best uh, let's not talk about current politics. It's all a bit of a disaster. Um, to set the scene, the uh, Laura Piddock, who's the MP for the North West Durham, um, for North West Durham, and she's also a Labour politician, gave her maiden speech in 2017, and she said, "This building is intimidating. It reeks of establishment and power. Its systems are confusing. Some may say archaic." and it was built at a time when my class and my sex would have been denied a place within it because we are deemed unworthy. 
I think it really brings home the fact that actually the House of Commons is a really uncomfortable place for women to work in and to exist in. We do not have a 50-50 um, split between male and female MPs yet, and it's actually been very, very difficult for women to kind of earn their space there. Um, does anyone know what happened in the UK uh, in 1918? It was about 101 years ago. No? Uh, it was the first time some women got the right to vote in the UK. So women have only been able, and not all women, have only been able to vote in 19, uh, for the last 100 years. Actually, until very, very recently, I was within the group of people that could not vote um, until 10 years later, so 1928, because I was not 30 years old, I was not married, and I was not a homeowner. So all three of those categories meant I was completely excluded. So that was 100 years ago. Um, parliamentary archives and team there really kind of were very aware of that date, 100 years, that's quite exciting. But um, the next bit is also exciting. Um, not many people know this, but until 1778, women were allowed to sit in the public galleries in the House of Commons. They were allowed to sit there and listen to the debates that were going on within the chamber and engage with this. Um, that was until 1778, and as this quote shows, they were then banned from that space. This was partly because of this situation where a woman refused to move when strangers were called to be cleared from the gallery, but it was also linked up to more other political situations going on, the fact that journalists wanted more space to be able to write, because there wasn't enough space for them if the women were present. Um, however, in 1818, we start to get 200 years, might I add, uh, ago, we start to get rumours of women occupying a different space in Parliament. They started to sit in an area known as the ventilator, which was directly above the House of Commons, to listen to the debates that were going on within the chamber and engage in that way. So here we have 200 years of women engaging in politics within the House of Commons. Um, and everyone loves anniversaries and celebrations and commemorations, so um, the Voice and the Vote exhibition was formed. Uh, this was a vote organised by... Uh, I think it's the History of Art Department as well as the Parliamentary Archives uh, by a team of uh, Mari and Melanie, who were amazing. And they organised this exhibition to um, really bring forward the stories about women in politics in the UK over the last 200 years and how they've occupied that space, but also how those, um, that story is still very, very relevant today. Where's the immersion coming? Uh, conveniently, at York at the same time, another project was finishing. Um, around 2016. This is the Virtual St Stephen's project. So um, the House of Commons was originally a chapel. The first House of Commons was originally a chapel. And then during the Reformation, uh, when we abandoned Medi, um, we were no longer allowed, uh, let me try that again, where the religion in the UK changed. Chapels such as this, which you can't see very well because the light is bad. Do we have the ability to turn the lights down? Um, Sorry, it looks really nice on my screen. And, uh, I, everyone looked at me funny and I was like, you can't see this properly, can you? Um, so yeah, in, um, when after the Reformation, uh, the, this chapel, which was also the home of the sort of political life in the UK anyway, pre prior to this, this building um, became the first House of Commons. Okay, that's a bit better. <laughs> okay, it's a bit dark. Um, so this image was produced as part of a project called the St Stephen's Project, which was another project out of York, and it, this was produced by Dr Anthony Massington, who, if you like reconstruction and visualisation, you probably know her. <laughs> Maybe we give up on the light, sorry. <laughs> I hope you got like a nice flash there of this, uh, this beautiful building. Uh, but with the end of that project, we wanted to continue our relationship with, the par with Parliament and Parliament and Archives. Um, but also, uh, towards the end of that project, they realised they'd created all these beautiful illustrations of the building. Um, then they previewed it using this kind of experience that sat within um, various parts of the sort of parliamentary buildings um, to engage people in the long history of Parliament. Um, and they presented it to... Uh, the public or a group of trial, and they complained that they thought the sound was broken. Um, I, you might be able to guess that their sound wasn't broken, they just hadn't included any sound in it. So um, I was called in very, very quickly to create a few oralisations of the 1707 House of Commons. I've just got a little example for you. A speech made by Henry Beaufoy to the House of Commons, 25th of April, 1792, on the slave trade. Show me a crime of any sort, and in the slave trade I will show you that crime in a state of tenfold aggravation. 
Give me an instance of guilt, a treasure to report, and the slave trade will exhibit instances of that guilt, more in better, more strongly rooted in ill, diffusing a more malignant poison and spreading a deeper horror. Um, so we produced a little organisation, but we realised there's a lot of potential here to not only build on this kind of immersive experience creating like uh, 3D sound, but we could also build on this story of the women occupying various spaces in the House of Commons and start to tell that story. So, listening to the Commons was born. Um, I think I'm going too slowly, so I'm going to have to speed up a bit. So, I told you about this attic space that women used to go and occupy to go and listen to the debates in the House of Commons. And these are actually the only three images we have of um, that space from the uh, period. So we can see these beautiful little drawings that really give a little bit of insight, a little understanding of how that space worked. So we can see the faces peeking through at the MPs below, um, and then uh, visitors to the space as well. Um, and yeah, like I said, we thought we'd combine this with a sort of 3D audio experience. So the sound you listened to earlier, it wasn't just generated as um, uh, by like someone reading a speech. We'd actually convolved that, or we mixed it up with the room impulse response of a model we had generated. Um, so yeah, I'm, in this case, I'm definitely talking about immersion as something beyond just a visual experience. So when we think of immersion, we often think very much about VR experiences where you can go in and look in 360 degrees. And actually, we're thinking more about the sound prospects. So this is the listening, you can't see that either, I don't think, the listening room at the Audio Lab. Um, and that's a setup of uh, sound from all over the place. Um, so how did I build my model? What was my methodology? I worked off the results of the kind of collation of evidence undertaken by the St. Stephen's project. And I put, this was like one of my key pieces of evidence. And this is a floor plan um, or section drawing of the, room, the building we're speaking about. I don't know if this is going to work. Yes. So here we, this bit, this bit here is the House of Commons. And this bit here is the attic directly above. And you can see the ventilator here that women were placing their heads through to listen to what was going on below. And you might be able to see, like, just looking at it, you know that the visual experience of peeking through those little holes, you wouldn't really be able to see very much. It was very, very much all about an acoustic or a listening experience going there. So these physical spaces <laughs> <laughs> formed um, a lot of the kind of basis for our model. So we took those spaces and those sizes and we built up a, like, a, a kind of a model, a physical model. But we also use things like, the, I always use this image because there aren't very many yeah. pictures. Um, <laughs> uh, so this is um, this is House Commons, and from this you can really get a feel of what the furnishings and fittings were in the building. So acoustics uh, are not just about the physical size of a space; it's also about the material properties. So, for example, and this room's a really good example of an acoustic space because these side panels. <laughs> these side panels uh, reflect sound really well and these panels on the other side um, they've been they're acoustic panels and they're designed to um, kind of scatter the sound so it doesn't project too much or too little so it's des making a space that's designed to be spoken in in this manner it's not designed for singing or music or anything like that and so those things you get I can program into my model as well um, and I kind of built this off the results of the other buildings. So when we matched them up with visualizations, it should sound right. So this is my model. It looks really ugly because it's not meant to be viewed. It's meant to be uh, listened to. Um, so yes, it doesn't look very interesting, but actually this has programmed in a full chamber of, um, of MPs listening to debates. It's got positions of this um, places where people are speaking from and where they're listening to. Um, and all those uh, rectangles, you can see, while they look look a bit sad, they um, they they programmed in to deal with these reflections or absorbing factors. So it works like this: so you basically press go on your model, and you get something out called a room impulse response, and that's the kind of the signal of the space. Um, and you mix that up. Uh, with an anechoic recording, so a recording that is undertaken in a dead space, a space which doesn't have these acoustic properties involved, and they're called anechoic chambers. So here's an example of an anechoic sound. sound involved with the rhythm pulse response from the House of Commons we modelled. So I hope you can really hear the difference 
difference there. You can see how the sound really kind of evokes a feeling of um, a particular type of space. Um, but that's music, and we're talking about the House of Commons debating chamber. Um, so we needed to get some audio to go into this exhibition that kind of worked a bit better, that was more authentic or more appropriate. Um, and we generated this by borrowing the House of Commons, which was quite good fun. And we got current MPs to sit in the House of Commons and represent MPs from the relevant period, which um, we kind of had to do because there's another, like one of these ridiculous rules in the House of Commons is unless you're an MP, you're not allowed to sit on the benches. So we had to borrow MPs to do it for us, which was really good. But we, we created this script from the newspapers of the time which were reporting on the process. So I hope this will work. 3rd of August, 1832, and Henry Hunt is presenting a petition in support of women's suffrage. Sir Frederick Trench responds. Mr Henry Hunt. Uh, I rise to present a petition. <laughs> to present a petition which I dare say some members will find most amusing. This is the petition of Mary Smith, a lady of family and fortune. Sorry. Um, I'm really sorry, that's really sad because it's usually really amazing. Um, I'm afraid I think we're just going to have to roll with it. Um, and I can share the links online to make the sound a bit better. Um, the, the sound went into the exhibition space like this, and this is a preliminary round, but this shows how we recreated that original image that I showed you of uh, the women peeking through and the MPs below. So the experience there was very, very physical to create more of an immersive experience. And for me, that was really important because it really highlighted how, people, how these women were experiencing that space. Um, the exhibition was really successful. It was open for three months and we had 107,000 visitors over that three months. Tickets were free, but you did have to go through the uh, airport security style access to Westminster Hall. 3rd of August. Um, quickly reflecting on our methodology. Um, this is how I do archaeology most of the time. I'm sitting with a dog on top of me because he won't leave me alone. <laughs> but I sit on a computer and I do stuff and I'm doing that because I want to know the stuff about people in the past. To do that, I access archaeological remains, archival stuff, standing remains, all of these things that kind of all gets put in. To do this, and then I use that to kind of collate, model, analyse those kind of things. And from that, I generate an interpretation. However, there's still a gap. That is still my interpretation. I still don't know exactly how people existed, how people did stuff in the past. And there is, that gap's always going to exist. We can't ever completely eradicate that that's a problem. Um, and I'm stopping, I, I'm kind of not worrying about it as much as I used to because there isn't an answer, but there's lots of approaches to take that. And for me, the approach we took here involved a bit of creativity. So if I'm reflecting on the process we took, we, we, we had to cut corners, we had to negotiate our evidence because we're never going to be able to create a full set of data. Um, and I find creativity kind of almost the best way to negotiate a gap. And immersive experiences are a mechanism for us to kind of generate that creativity. Um, practicalities though, um, we had to also think about some of the problems that we encountered, so audibility, and this is the big bit where I talk about the creativity element, is that uh, the models we made, I'm afraid you couldn't hear that very well, but we couldn't necessarily put the perfect model from our modelling experience into that exhibition because it would not allow visitors to really understand what was going on. Some, some of our first models really demonstrated really, really resonant space. It was almost impossible to hear what the different speakers were saying. So we had to kind of make some negotiation over what we would kind of have modelled as an authentic experience versus make it actually possible to people to understand that experience. Authenticity. Um, why might this be a problem? <laughs> they had to put the speakers up in the sky. Um, I'm no, I've no idea why. It only comes out when we're installing it the day before. Um, obviously, that's going to affect how you understand the sound coming out from the MPs who are meant to be talking below, if the sound is actually coming up from above. But it's still creating an experience that people could understand and relate to, I think. Finally, the audience. We had to make negotiations over the audience. So actually, one of these holes was set up to be designed for a, a disabled visitor to the exhibition. So um, that's not authentic if you were worrying about authenticity. However, it does provide accessibility to that experience as well. 
and I don't see why that shouldn't be included. Um, I have given you a really kind of rapid tour there, I'm afraid, and I think I got a bit put off by the kind of disco lights, so I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I just wanted to say, like, I think, like, I, well, I've talked quite a lot in general about how sound can be used to help us sort of negotiate a deeper understanding of lived experience of the past. But I think I wanted to kind of show as well that it can be a really engaging tool for people to uh, talk about um, the public understanding of the past as well. Thank you.